morning, morning. The alarm went off a bit early this morning. I'm not sure the alarm actually did go off. The earth alarm. Everybody in Tokyo, everybody in Tokyo was awakened this morning by quite a big one. Went on for a long time too. About 5 o'clock, 4.50 or somewhere like that. You felt it over there? How do you know about this? <laughs> There's such a thing as being too much of a fan for Japan, you know, <laughs> when you feel the earthquakes over there. <laughs> I don't know the number. I didn't look it up. But it was, you know, it was probably in Tochigi or Chiba or somewhere out there. It had that same feeling. Off the Chiba coast, okay, hey, hey. Three in Tokyo, it was more than a three here, I don't know. Tokyo's a big place, I don't know. I get this, I talk to Sadako on the phone or whatever, and she'll say, what earthquake? And I'll say, it was big last night. We're both in Tokyo, but we're 40 kilometers apart. It was, it was, it woke us up, just instantly, bang, wake up, and then, oh, 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 do I need to get up? Do I need to get up? No, I think I'll sit this one out, and it gradually, gradually settles down. You know. Windows rattle, taka, 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 taka. Good fun, good fun until it's not fun. Here we go. You can see where we are. We're going to pick up exactly where we left off the other day. I know we're going to continue carving the background. This is the color block background for this one. For those of you who don't know what's going on, we're replicating this image. The block I'm carving right now will be for the background color. So we're cutting away everything that belongs to the horse and the people, hoping not to make a mistake as I go along here. When we're finished this, we'll do another transfer for another one of the colors, the gray or something. What else is happening today? I know this, just this work should continue block number one, block two, block three. There is, I know, there is a show and tell today. I was hoping actually there would be a spectacular show and tell. The goods haven't arrived. Something, I know, in fact, now that I mention about that, what I should do, what I should do is poke in. Those of you who have got nothing to do <laughs> sometime or while you're watching this, I'm going to poke in a link, if I can find it here, to a, a local auction, a Yahoo auction that I picked up. What's today? Thursday. Wednesday, Tuesday. Tuesday night there was an auction on. Here, it's this one. Take a look at it later when you have some time. I, I bid on that and bought it. And it, I was hoping it might come this morning in time for the stream, but he didn't ship it yesterday. The dealer says we ship within one week, blah, 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 one of those lazy guys. So, so we'll get it sometime in a, in a chance to look at it next week. But in the meantime, if you have time, take a look at that auction. And if you had seen that, would you have bid on it? And how much would you have bid and whatever? And I was chatting about this with my friend Jacques. He might be here or he might have gone to bed already. Okay, let's go. I'll get to my work, and you guys can uh, have your conversation there. Is there a reason Twitch only keeps your last week of videos? I believe it's a two-week policy. I think it's 14 days is their policy. Unless it's changed, I don't know. 14 days was what it used to be. They keep them up for 14 days. The streams are being scooped. Some of the fans are scooping the streams, downloading them, and putting them up to a separate Facebook, uh, not Facebook page, um, a separate YouTube page. So they are being archived on YouTube by some of the fans.
uh, speaking about YouTube a minute ago there. <laughs> There's YouTube on all. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. No, it's three weeks ago now. Three weeks ago. Yesterday, I guess. Three weeks ago yesterday, our YouTube channel crossed uh, the uh, milestone of having uh, 100,000 subscribers. And that's what they call their silver. They have those creator awards, and uh, the 100,000 milestone is uh, silver. So I went to the website and uh, see what's going on, and it said, uh, is that inside or outside? Just not there. inside. And the website said uh, after a week or so of reaching a milestone you'll receive a message from YouTube in your dashboard uh, giving you a link to a place where you can go and uh, put your name and address in and get your silver button, your creator reward. And nothing has happened. That's three weeks nothing's happened. So I went back there to check and it said uh, if after three weeks you haven't heard from us click here to go to this page and drop us a note. And I clicked there and went to the page and it said, please log in with your YouTube partner account. I'm not a YouTube partner. We don't run ads. You know, it said your YouTube AdSense partner account, you know, whatever. And we don't run ads on the videos. So I don't have a, a YouTube partner account. So it looks like, I don't know the dirty details here, but it looks like maybe those uh, creator awards are only available for people who, uh, who have monetized their channels. So if that's the case, then, uh, then I'm out of luck. Because there's no way we're going to run ads on this thing, or on those things. So. so maybe, I'm not sure about this yet, but maybe they're not going to... I'm not eligible for the, for the silver award. In which case, what should I do? Photocopy one or something? <laughs> Put it in the wall. I really should have printed this in a bit darker black. It's too gray, difficult to see, you know. Nothing like making your work easy for yourself. You know? Now, is that horse or is that string? What is this? That's string. here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. What's this? Glue conversations? Glue, lino, height, height, height. We go to the auction. No, those are, there's a bunch of uh, 20th century reproductions in there, of course. Nothing special. But in among that auction, there's some other interesting stuff, I think.
It's really hard to tell what's inside and what's outside. You know? It's easy to see in the finished print, but uh, over here it's difficult to see. You know? That's inside, that's outside. Yet another rainy, rainy day in Tokyo. You know, I'm convinced this is a terrible year for rain, but it's funny. Amy san was here yesterday. I said, another rainy day, day. And she said, what do you mean another rainy day? And I'm like, it's raining all the time. She says, no, this year's been really cool, really nice, really not so, uh, I don't know, not so many bad days. And so it's funny, with the same weather, the two of us seeing the same situation. And she's convinced it's a good year, the nice weather. And I'm convinced it's soaking wet this year, but. No big deal to me. I don't go anywhere these days, indoors all day long. I'm gaining weight, no exercise. Now, this is also confusing. What's happening down here under the tail? Confusing, confusing. There is background visible between the leg and the tail. Background goes under the tail here. So that's background, so that's got to come this way. Okay, just some tiny tapping here. Don't panic. You're going to see the hammer, but don't sweat it. Just some tiny tapping here. Outdoor activities are safe if you stay away from others. It's not so much just that I can't go outside. It's busy, busy, busy. There's so much going on here, but yeah, you're right. I could and should go for a walk if nothing else, you know, whatever. I should do that, of course. You know.
No excuse. Come on.
Okay, I think we've got that one. Okay, we got that one. I think it seems we got a bunch of new people here this morning. Don't, not quite sure what's going on. So we'll just quick recap of what's happening. We're making a wood buck print that's going to look something like this. There's white areas, there's colored areas, there's black lines. We're partway through the process. The black lines are already carved on this block. We finished it the other day. We transferred those lines, printed them, and pasted them down on this block. That gives us an idea of where the lines are. So we could carve another block like this for the background color. We're not replicating this print, we're doing it in an oval shape. So that's two blocks now finished. We have the blocks for the black lines that will print these, and we have the block for the color background. I need two more. I need a block for the horse color and a block for the gray color. And we'll move along now and start to prepare those. do that, we have to come back to the first one, the black one, and we have to print on transfer paper, print the black lines again, and transfer them to another sheet of paper. And I forgot, before I started the stream this morning, I forgot to get my ink. So excuse me, let me go and get a brush and some black. I got to unplug the mic to go and do that, excuse me. Back in a minute. Hear me now. What can you hear me now? What can you hear me now? So the transfer is going to be done on a double paper. We've got a piece of just normal s sort of construction paper. And on top of it, using spray glue, I put a thin layer of our famous Japanese gumpy paper, super thin paper. So we're going to print onto the gumpy. Well, just you'll see, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. I'm not on a chair, I'm on a stand. We've built a, a stand here, so I'm sitting on a sort of a bench. My legs go down. My legs are on the floor. My feet are on the floor, but I'm sitting just as though it was a chair, but it's sitting on a bench. And the bench platform goes to the front, and on top of the bench sits my carving bench. This moves. This is just a carving bench placed on top of the, the, the die, the, the the thing I'm sitting on. All through the earlier years I was making prints, the first 20 years or so, I sat on tatami mats with my legs crossed with this bench and my feet under the bench. It was okay, I did it. But when I got to whatever 50 odd or something, it really started to, uh, the negative side, bent legs all day long, all the time. So I switched to this system, and in fact, our whole workshop, now all of our printers here work this way. We have built raised platforms. Our feet go down inside, and we can do the work with the same kind of uh, mood and feeling on our bench. And yet it's much less, I know, impactful on your body. 
That was a note reminding me I'm supposed to talk about three things today. Okay. If you saw the, the video we put up just a while ago, the uh, video about the epilogue after meeting Itosan the carver, there's lots of footage in there you can see. He's carving at his bench on the floor. And if you're used to it, it's okay, you know, it's no problem. He carved like that for 70 years or whatever it was, you know. It's very peaceful. Okay, there's our two transfer sheets. We can get rid of the brush and stuff now. So here, just the outlines, and that will now, we'll find an empty place on the block. Let's uh, go. This is going to be, for example, the horse color. And this wood is not the greatest wood in town, you know, so I'm going to try and find a cleaner place for it here. The horse, actually, we can go up here, it's all right. Is the paper out? The paper is indeed out. Thank you. Somebody reminded me yesterday too. There are printers coming. Today it's Ayumi-san upstairs. Yesterday was Ishikawa-san. Although on the days Ishikawa-san comes, for you guys to remind me about the paper is pointless because she comes like 6.30, 7 o'clock. <laughs> yesterday I beat her. My alarm clock went off yesterday about 6 o'clock. I went upstairs, took her paper out, then came back to bed. I'm sitting there in the dawn. I'm reading my email and stuff like this. And I can hear little, there's a mouse coming upstairs. And she does. She came upstairs and went upstairs assuming I was still asleep. But yeah, today's paper is out, thank you. I'm not catching all this, I'm sorry, hopeless. So again, those of you who haven't seen it, we've just cut registration marks. They didn't, doesn't matter where I cut them on the wood, the paper will go anywhere. I've cut them in a place that we're trying to avoid. There's some defects in the wood here. And for example, there's a knot here, and there's a place here where there's a uh, grain mark. And this block is gonna be for the horse. So we're, I've arranged it so that the horse area here fits in a nice clean area of the block. Then to make my work easier on the next step, what we're going to do here is looking at the guide here. We're going to color this in. This has nothing to do with the colors that will appear in the finished print. We're not going to make a red horse. Simply, this is to help me cut this next block. We're just cutting shapes at this point. The printers can take it and put whatever kind of pigments they want on it. Yeah. 
There's the vacuum cleaner lady. I think that corner should be on the horse, you know. Do you see we got our little stones? They turn out really nice. I can also see in a place I forgot to carve back on the key block. I don't know if you can see it. Zoom in too far here. Can't get zoomed in. Over on this guy. There's a space here. This is solid black. And it shouldn't be solid black. It should be outlines. We can see it here. It should be a triangle. So we'll go and pop that off later. Okay, there we go. This block will do for the horse color. Again, the red is nothing to do with the color of the finished print. It's just to show the areas here. The red will be on the horse's legs and on this guy's leggings and feet. And nothing to do with the guy sitting up top. The guy sitting up top and all the stuff around him is going to be off this block. So let's paste it down and get going. Conversation, conversation, conversation. Yeah, there's also a, a dirt today, the fly, fly buzzing around his kneecap to show. <laughs> They're back here. Where is that? Yep, yep. Well, let's do it right now. Let's do it right now. There's the triangle. See what I'm doing. Let me... That's better. There's the triangle, and there's the tiny area. So I forgot to clear away part of the background. See that? Bingo. Done. That's what test printing's for. Okay, let's glue this guy down. It's a little jeweler's loop. It's just a little, it's one of those things that goes in, oops, dropped it. It's one of those things that goes in your eyes. You can stick it in there and, uh, you know. I, 
couldn't imagine using it for, for regular carving, but for a little tiny, let's have a peek, like that, it's perfect. I've had that for years, it's ancient, old as I am. There we go, all visible, ready to go. Well, that's the peel, there is no peel, there is no peel. That's it, you just saw it. Just take enough away to see what's going on. Why, were the peel judges ready? There's peels and there's peels. This isn't a peel. Okay, what do we got here? Conversation, conversation. Watching YouTube, thank you very much. What's this? Any chance of Jed's new illustrations to become a new project? I'm not really sure what you're talking about. I don't know, Jed does lots and lots and lots of stuff that we don't see, so I'm not really sure what you're saying. I don't know. Is Gumpy kind of mulberry washing? No, 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 no. There's three fibers in Japan used for making paper, mulberry fiber, kozo, which we use for our printing paper. There's mitsumata fiber, a different kind of tree, which is also used for paper making, but not so much in the printmaking world. Then there's gumpi, it's a different plant that grows in the mountains, and that's made for making paper, and it has super silky thin fibers, and this is from gumpi plant. So there's three common plants involved. We use two of them, the mulberry for our printing paper, and gumpi for our transfer paper. People use this for book binding, for repairing books, repairing paintings. Yeah, there's three fibers. Mitsumata, Kozo, and Gampi. Jed did a doom drawing, got big on Reddit. Yeah, again, I don't know, I'm sorry. I don't, like I said, Jed is a busy, busy guy. He does all kinds of stuff. We can only do a very small percentage of his stuff on Woodbots. Although he now has some. If you go to his website, ukiyoeheroes.com, and look at the Woodbox side, there's tons of stuff. In fact, the, our stuff is near the bottom of his Woodbox page. He's got tons of stuff he's publishing now with other, other carvers and printers. He's really determined to, uh, to help get a bunch of other people up and running on this, you know. Jed is really, he's putting money on the line. He's on hiring people. He's got all kinds of woodblock prints there that are not made in this workshop. So we are seeing other people. <laughs> so he's using other carvers and printers. And uh, next year's print series that we're doing, our next year's subscription series, is... Whatever, it'll be time to talk about that later, but. Uh, well, this is the way it should be, you know. 
you know, the fact that JED has resources like this and more images than we can possibly make ourselves here, it's common sense for him to uh, use other workshops as well, you know. We're not in any way you know, upset or negative or whatever about this. The more people who can do this, the better it is for all of us. You know. There's no monopoly here on making traditional woodblock prints, absolutely. And from Jed's point of view, part of it is actually common sense. He's 30, um, what is it? My kids were born in 83 and 86, Four, five, six. My kids must be 35 and 37, so Jed must be 36, I guess. So he's 36, and I'm, uh, I'm not. I'm 70 next year, so Jed's just looking at the future, common sense, you know. He knows we're doing okay right now, lots of stuff. Moko Hong Kong is doing really well. Dave's workshop is cooking. But he just looks at the calendar and thinks, okay, where's this all going to go in 10, 20, X more years? So he's doing a really, really sensible thing. He is trying to nurture and, uh, and, and help create a new generation of, uh, of workshops, people that can do this stuff, you know. And this is really, really cool to see this happening, you know. And for him, it's just uh, insurance, it's common sense, you know. My workshop may continue after I'm gone, and then again. Is this a hobby for you or my profession? No, I've been making a living at this now for 40 odd years. I started as a dabbling, as a hobby. I was working in a music store doing computer programming, doing lots of stuff, tried making some prints. It was clearly a hobby. We sold the first ones, I don't know, in 1982 or 83, somewhere around there. No, this is our, we have a workshop. There's 20 odd people working here in our business now. We are one of the major printmaking workshops here in Japan, anywhere. It's not 30 anymore. At the peak last year, before Corona, last autumn, we were training people for the print party. We actually were cutting checks, payroll checks, for over 30 people. We had 31 people one month. We don't have 31 people anymore. Uh, we pay regularly now. It's over 20. I don't have a count every month. There's over 20 people who are here in the Mokohankan uh, constellation. After Corona, lots of things have changed. Some of the printers are now, they're independent contractors. They're not my employees. They're working for me full time. We just send blocks that print back and forth, back and forth. But they send an invoice and we pay their invoices. So I can't really call them my employees anymore. But we have 20 plus people in our orbit here. People that are directly employees or who are just simply just, that's all they do is they work for us making stuff. You know. So I don't know how to count it anymore. How many employees do we have is not a single, a single number anymore. Dave's prints are up to three times the price of the other prints in Jed's shop. Is there a reason for that? Yes, there is, there is, there is, of course. Those guys are very much uh, sort of in training compared to what we're doing here. And the Jed is subsidizing a lot of it, I think. He's actually paying them more than he's selling it for because as we talked about, he wants to build, build a reservoir of craftsmen, you know. In my case, the price that we sell our prints for are an exact reflection of the costs of making them, paying the craftsmen, professional craftsmen, and the materials. Although having said that, our prints are not 
and are not grotesquely expensive. They're very much in line with uh, the production. Those other ones on Jed's shop are a fabulous bargain right now, absolutely. Now some of this here is going to overlap because I'm not sure exactly where, nobody knows, where does the horse's body finish and where does the outside. So what I've done here, on the previous block for the outside, I cut the line somewhere around here. So the outside color went in and under the tail here. And I'm now carving the body quite wide under the tail. It could be that we're, we're definitely we're going to have a double color area here which we can trim back from either side. What I don't want is a white space in one of these, so definitely anything to avoid having a white streak here. When you're doing this on all the prints, you see this all the time with these color blocks, doubling up overlapping areas to make sure we don't have a white streak space. He's still vacuuming. It seems to be taking the time this morning. How do I procure carvers and printers? It's a mix of stuff. Some of the printers here, Aimi sat upstairs today. She came to us straight out of high school. It looked good. We tried her for a few days and we've never let her go. Ishikawa-san came to us through the Takumi workshop. She went to a friend of mine, As Asaka Motoharu, she wanted to learn a bit about carving, so she went to his uh, training, training school first, paid him. And after a while, he called me up one day and said, there's a lady here who I think you should talk to. And then some of the other printers and carvers were working for us. There are people who worked for other workshops, either when they were younger or, or still. They, they quit there and came over here. So it's not headhunting. We don't actively headhunt from other workshops. We don't do that. But we have people working here now who did come from other places. So it's a mix, a mix, a mix. What we don't have is we don't have a training facility. Here. There's no school. Sign up and come on over and we'll train you to do this. We cannot make that investment on somebody who almost certainly will not continue with the job. If we had a much bigger, much more flourishing workshop with people working here all over the place, an empty room where, you know, trainees could sort of sit and watch and work and stuff like that. But these current years, especially this corona year, we don't have that facility. People are mostly working at home. So it's really difficult to provide a training environment. Really, really difficult. And if this continues for a long time, that's going to become a, a major problem how to train people when we are all so socially isolated. When there's a workshop where we're all batched together doing things, it's easier to have a training environment. But this current situation is really difficult for, for training. We'll see how long it lasts, I don't know. Are we doing well? Health and business. Yes, we're doing really, really well. Really, really well. We, we refocused, of course. The shop is dead. The shop is finished. The shop revenue is zero. Uh, so in consequence, as a result of that, we have, we have done more activity online. And we've always had an online presence, always, I mean, since there's been an online. But it's become much more of a priority for us. And in fact, I don't know if I should say this, this month, June now, June 25th, we have uh, six days left. We are on track this month for matching the revenue from June last month. And that's when we were running the Asakusa shop. That's not a thing. I can't say this year we're going to do the same as last year because that's not true. Because June last year in the shop was part of the summer slump. The spring was huge in the shop. The autumn was huge. In the summer it was ma, 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 ma. 
So in one of those months where last year was ma, 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 we were able to match last year's income overall. So we're doing okay, we're surviving. We're all working very hard. We need more printers. If another printer walked in the door today, I would lock the door behind him and trap him in here. We need more printers, there's huge demand. Our waiting list for the Great Wave, yesterday seven people joined it. Just whatever, I don't even know what to do about this. There's a waiting list for this year's series. Our major concern, well, our major concern, as the, as the boss here, as the operator, as the, the driver, the guy in the driving seat, my major concern at the moment right now is not actually the, the virus anymore. The virus is going to, we can see sort of where this is going to go. Probably, you know, you know the, the lockdown, the whack-a-mole, here in Japan at least, the whack-a-mole, it's going to come up, we press it down, it's going to come up, we press it down. My number one concern is not the virus at the moment, it's November the 3rd. I say that without any, any uh, hostility towards our American friends or, or whatever. Just as, honestly speaking, that's my major concern. November 3rd and the d days, weeks, and months running up to it and what will happen after it. That's my number one. That's the thing I lose sleep about when thinking about the future of my business here. You know. All right, I do believe that's cut. Easy work, you know, easy work, easy work. Why will the election hurt the business? I'm, I'm, it's a number of things, I know, whatever, I may be paranoid about this, I don't know, I know. From where I sit, it seems America is really going through some crises. I know, obviously, well, everybody knows that. And when you think about the possible scripts here, there could be some really so severe social unrest in America this autumn. There could be some real severe. I mean, the, 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 the demonstrations and stuff the past few weeks have been what they are. We know how that's going to go. Demonstrations are going to come up. They're going to go down. There will be social changes happening as a result of those. There could be major, major social unrest, like military stepping in and all whatever come November, if you're a pessimist about this. Whether that will have an economic effect or whether that country is gonna take a dive or whatever, and it could severely impact the whole rest of this planet. Whether the rest of us like it or not, America is a, a global leader in, in everything, economic matters and, and, and everything. Sort of how America goes, the rest of us go. I'm not, I'm not a pessimistic about life, but I'm, a, I'm really worried about that particular situation, you know, so. Whatever, you, you look at it as you will look at it, you know, so. 
Okay, what should we do now? We could get our hammer out and hammer away at this and make some noise. I don't really want to do that. I think what we should do is let's do the same thing now. Let's just move on to the gray one. Let's just do another one. I printed two of those sheets. Let's zoom out a little bit. We now have to do the same thing for the gray. I mean, whatever, I don't want to start a long political discussion here, I'm sorry, I don't want to start a, a fight, you know, Trump this, Trump that, whatever, just, just as an outsider watching this, you have clearly just to easily, there's two good, there's the one group and another group, there's two very, very strong, well-represented political groups in America, and uh, it's no good those of us outside saying, oh, that Trump guy, whatever, whatever, if that Trump guy is what the American people choose to be their leader, then that's it, so be it, that's what America is. So, uh, but for the rest of us, it's, you know, oh my God, how are we gonna do this, you know, so, anyway. Okay, as you can see, there's lines on this one that are not on the key block. So this happens to, this happens to us lots of times. This gray here, it's not something that transferred from the key block, so how do we do this? In the classical situation, the absolute best classical situation in the old days, after doing the key block, these printouts go to the designer. And the designer then takes these things and says, okay, I want <laughs> waiting list plus one. The designer says, okay, I want this and this and this and this. And the designer would sit here and do this. He would draw these various shapes and things on these transfer sheets. Now, Hoaxai's not here to do this. So Dave's job is now simply to get something close here. Again, we're not trying to make a, we're not trying to make a forgery where I have to carefully get this under the microscope and copy exactly every single line so nobody would uh, see the difference. We are simply going to draw the same general effect. Uh, we'll do the same thing. In order to make it easy to see, once I start carving, we color them in in red. And this is not going to be red, it's going to be gray. And I think we get his hooves as well. And over here on this guy. If I missed anything, I think we've got it. The muzzle bag, the hooves, there's nothing on the tail. Oh, those little tiny stones hanging down. They get gray. Shadows under, shadows here, shadows here, nothing up on top. And we're running out of places on this piece of wood to put things, but we should be able to put this over here, somewhere over here. Sure, let's do this. Oh, 
But we've left the guy out. Someone's complaining there's somebody missing. We've left him out. We are just, we are just borrowing some scenery from Hokusai. I made this years ago. I cut from the Hokusai manga. I remember there may have been more people in the original one, and I cut some out and just made an adaptation of Hokusai. It's, you know, it's all public domain material, and for this share certificate that we're making this time, this is going to go in here. Three people was just too much of a crowd, so I'm just borrowing from Hokusai a couple of guys walking in the snow, and that's going to appear in this year's share certificate. And I really don't think Hokusai would be upset about this. He didn't live in an era that was all that, uh, they didn't care about this sort of stuff. Everybody just used the material. Hokusai is not rolling over in his grave. Hokusai is happy that we are sitting here talking about him, enjoying his stuff hundreds of years after he lived and worked. He's not rolling over anywhere. It's not the culture he lived in. He himself, too, they borrowed and re-sketched and redrew. It was the ultimate sort of remix kind of society, you know. They didn't even have the word, a word for copyright. He ain't rolling over anywhere. He's one of the most famous people on this planet. He's happy. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. It's just people who want us, want our stuff, and I can't help them. I don't know why I laugh. I'm sorry. Maybe that's somebody on the stream here today who's going to put their name on the list. I, I, you know, thank you. Thank you. It's sometimes actually really quite frustrating, you know. We've been so successful at doing what we do here, and yet we cannot scale it. Someone who's building, building a software game or something, if a million people buy it, great. If 10 million people buy it, great. We can't scale. We can't scale. The bean counters say, just put the price up, sell the Great Wave for $600 a copy. That'll cut your waiting list down. You'll sell the same number of copies, and you'll get five times the money. The bean counters will say that. I can't honestly do that. I just cannot bring myself to do that. The octopus print started to ship. Yes, yes, yes. All my batch, my batch of 100 is gone. And Yamamoto-san brought a second batch of 100. And they are still here. It's open at the moment for orders. We are not uh, on a waiting list for the octopus. We have octos in stock at the moment. Just a minute, let me get this done. Hang on, I'm trying to follow too many things at the same time. The octopus print should probably remain in stock as we go forward for a couple of reasons. The demand for it is not as great as the Great Wave demand, and also it's printing, it's a fair amount easier to print. The Great Wave, our version of it, is at, at the level we're trying to make it is astonishingly difficult, and not all of our printers can handle it properly. But the octopus print actually is, uh, is quite a bit easier. It's not easy, but it's uh, much more manageable. So we should be able to keep that in stock. There's no way of getting another set of blocks to print the wave with. Well, we have it on our schedule. Chonsan knows that we're going to re-carve it. My set of blocks at the moment, we're up to, I think it's 1,650 copies somewhere on there. The blocks are still doing very well. We're going to do another YouTube video when we hit 2,000. We're going to microscope the blocks and show what's going on. And we don't know how many copies we'll end up making. 3,000 maybe, I don't know, somewhere on there. At some point, the block will wear down too much, and we will not want to sell prints from it. So Chonsan and I, our other carver here, we are preparing for this. We have a piece of wood set aside for the next version of our Great Wave. 
and we have the hunch to tracing. Of course, I did the tracing, and that's Photoshop data. So we have wood ready, and we have a tracing ready. So when our own block set gets to the point where we can see the end of the line half a year away or something, then John Sam will say, okay, Dave, away we go, and he will start carving our next version. I'm not gonna do it myself again. I'm 70 years old next year. There's no reason I should spend another couple of months working on a repetition. Give John Sam a, a chance to do it. We'll pay him a royalty, and away he goes. And he'll probably do a better job than I did. How do the printers feel about printing the octopus? We talked about this at the very beginning of the project, three, four years ago. When the idea came up to do it, I was concerned about this. A lot of, from a lot of people's point of view, that's, a, that's a not a very pleasant image. It's, to some people, it's, it's a disgusting thing to see. Most of our printers here are ladies. So at the very beginning of this, I put the idea into play and said, what would you guys think if maybe we thought about doing this? And without wanting to make them seem silly or whatever, there, were no, there was no feedback, no, I mean, no, uh, no blowback, no negative at all. These ladies are adults, and whether or not they want to be owners of a picture like that is one thing. None of them uh, expressed any negative feeling to me about printing it. Sure, no problem at all. I also checked carefully with our packing ladies, the people who work in our Omi workshop. These are ladies, they're, they're in their, like in whatever, they're in their 40s. They're, they have family, they have kids in school, they're family ladies, they work here. And it was possible that I felt they may not want to be involved with this, you know, wrapping stuff that, again, to some people is not so pleasant. So I checked with everybody here, and they said, no, no problem. They did say one thing, that sometimes, you know, Ishigami-san, for example, she had two kids, they come and, and do their homework in the workshop while she's doing her packing work. So she said, look, is it okay if there's a, I said, yeah, of course, that day, just put it away. Do it, do it on a day when your kids are not here. Common sense, of course, of course, of course. So yeah, I checked with all the people here, especially the girls to print, and uh, like I said, they're, they're normal adults, and nobody's being coerced into doing this at all. When's the next David's Choice video coming? It's, it's in preparation. It's half scripted. I'm gathering material. It's David's Choice number 11. It's going to be about the Tokaido series. It's coming. It's coming. Just stuff is, uh, quite a lot of stuff's getting in the way. So please, you know, hang on. It is coming. Yeah, the bottleneck for the wave. Yes, exactly. The blocks need to rest. So we could do that. This is actually an idea that, that, that does make sense. Don't wait for this first set to die before we carve a new set of blocks. That would be uh, something to do. The thing is, though, myself and Chonsan and Kawasaki-san, the three carvers here, we are up to our necks in it. Chonsan and Kawasaki-san are taking uh, you know, what it alternates doing the current year's subscription series. There's lots of stuff we would like to carve. There's the, the three cats, the ramen cats is now being finished. The last color block for that's being carved. We have lots of new projects we want to do. Just having Chon San take that time and spend a few months carving the wave, whatever, it's just not a priority for us right now, I'm sorry. I know lots of people want it, but we don't want to become a workshop that just does nothing else but make great wave reproductions, so. So, but yeah, that is an interesting idea. Carve multiple block sets and get multiple printers working on it. And we can all just make a living making copies of the waves. So, so. <laughs> but yes, it's an idea. That's an idea, so. For me, the last few days, yesterday I spent, I had a really, really pleasant day yesterday. It was Wednesday, nobody, each guy was working upstairs, nobody bothered me at all. I spent the whole day programming. I got a bunch of new modules. It's our, our bookkeeping system, you know, and people have asked, Dave, just, just use commercial bookkeeping software. Whatever, it, it just doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. But the bookkeeping software that I've written over the years for our business has had to be dramatically changed. I know, I'm learning so much about bookkeeping and accounting these days. You know. Up to last December, this was what we call Kojin Jigyo, a proprietorship. It wasn't an official company. And I don't know about overseas, but the bookkeeping rules in Japan, when you're running a Kojin Jigyo, what they want is a cash journal. It's 
cash journal bookkeeping. It's a single entry bookkeeping. Simply, there's all the money that comes into you. You declare it as income. Every penny you get is income. Then the money you use to earn that income, paying a carver, paying a printer, buying washi, whatever, that's deducted as an expense. The leftover is profit. Sounds simple, right? Don't all businesses work that way? No, they don't. And of course, I knew this intellectually before I started. I've worked in a business before. But I knew that when we ourselves became a company, a corporation, last November, with the bookkeeping starting in January, I knew that single entry bookkeeping is no longer applicable to, to a company activity. So we've had to rewrite all our background stuff to handle double entry. And creating from scratch a double entry bookkeeping system is not trivial. It's got to be secure. You know, you can't. One of the basic rules about double entry bookkeeping is there's no such thing as an eraser. You can never erase stuff. Once an entry is journaled, once something's done, once your month is closed, you can't go back and fiddle with it. How long from key block to last color? It's, it's impossible to make a statement about such a thing. I don't know. I know what people ask about this. Back when I was working by myself, I made surimono prints, stuff like this. This was one of those surimono prints. I did drawing, tracing, cutting a set of blocks, printing 200 copies, writing the story, shipping it in one month. And I kept that up for five years. This was an extremely simple example. Some of them were far more complicated, but 200 copies start to finish once a month was the, was the timetable I kept. our time. You okay? Oh, it's almost show and tell time. Am I going to try and play in the tops of the wave blocks? No. We did it for that simple block last month. The wave block, no. The key is just too dense and too complex. It's just too, too massive. There's just so many details all over the block. It's just far easier. Just grab a new piece of wood, cut it, and go for it. That simple crane print we did that with last month, that was okay. Although, Hontani, I think, given the time we spent fiddling with that last month, we could have just carved a new one during this in the same time, I believe. Genji Monogatari, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll read this later again, as always. I'll, at lunchtime, I'll sit and read this carefully. It's, I see a mention of Genji Monogatari there. And it's interesting because uh, our show and tell today is related to that. It's related. It's not, it's not the, the Okada Yoshio prints again, per se. And, uh, we showed on the show and tell a couple of weeks ago. I got another set of the Okada Yoshio Genji Monogatari prints came in. I showed them on the, on the show and tell a few weeks ago. And today, what I've got is not the prints. I'm not going to show you the prints. It's the same thing over and over again. What I've got, what I got from a Yahoo auction last week. Is it shown? Let's just do it. Let's just do it. Let's just show you. 9.15, 9.15, show until time. 9.15, 9.15. So this is related to that Genji Monogatari. I'll pop up just for a quick, just so those of you who don't know what's going on. If you've seen the beginnings video that I put up years ago, I talked about some of the first prints I saw in Japan, the first prints that I ever found. And it was prints, you uh, know, this stuff, right? Do you remember these? These were the series, there's one, two, three, four of them. These were the prints from the Genji Monogatari, a, a magazine story, blah, 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 and a set of four prints had been made from them. And we showed those on the, on the, on the, on the you know, stream here a couple of weeks ago. What happened just after I did that show and tell a couple of weeks ago, I have a, a, an auction alert. I'm, I'm on Yahoo Auctions all the time, and I have an alert in Yahoo Auctions to let me know whenever the word Okada comes up so that I can see whenever somebody finds one of those Okada 
Yoshio sets and puts on Yahoo Auctions, I see the alert on my computer and I've got the mail software set. If alert comes Yahoo containing word Okada Yoshio, mark in bright red and flash and play music for me. So I see about those when they come up on Yahoo Auctions. Anyway, the alert came in a couple of weeks ago. I went to the auction and said, what? And the photograph was this. It was a photograph of this. And I'm like, okay, what's this all about? And when you read the, read the description, what this is, this is the clippings over a three-year period from the Shukan Asahi, the weekly Asahi magazine, in which the author Tanabe Seiko drew, put her story out, her reimagining of the Genji Monogatari story. That's why this is called Shin Genji Monogatari, the new Genji Monogatari. She had been writing stories and books from years before this about you know, Nihon Koten Bunka, Japanese, you know, not traditional writing. What do you call it? Like for us, it's Beowulf and Chaucer and stuff before Shakespeare, uh, the early, early literature. And she'd been a specialist in the early literature uh, of Japan. And she was hired by the magazine to write a story, a reimagining of the Genji story. And somehow, I don't know anything about the, how this started, the magazine people got in touch with Okada Yoshio, and the two of them collaborated on a series that ran weekly in the Asahi, uh, Shukan Asahi, the weekly Asahi. And she wrote the story and he did the illustrations. And at the beginning, they were given five pages in every issue to do this. Partway along, after about a year, it was cut down to four pages, and it ran for three, nearly three years. And what came up on Yahoo Auctions last week is some dear little lady somewhere back in the 1970s got this magazine every week, got her scissors out, and clipped them out and here we now have them. Now these are not woodblock prints. What these are, and these have never been published in a book anywhere since this. They went in the magazine and bang out, they went into the world and it was all gone. These are Okada-san's watercolor uh, paintings, drawings, illustrations, sketches, whatever you use. And he did two of these every week for nearly three years. And what it is, four of those were taken by the publisher Saiki-san to make the series that we saw. So the ones that I just showed you, for example, these two and the two others, they appeared first as these magazines. And the lady, who she, they're not the whole magazine. What she did was she ripped out, it was most easy, because the magazine was a black and white magazine with a color at the beginning and a color in the middle. And these were right in the middle in the color pages. So she just bang, bang pulled them out, and here they are. And there are, I don't even know, 154 episodes here. And of course, you know what I'm saying. I mean, please, this will never happen. It cannot happen. But can you imagine if we had resources? Can you imagine the set of woodblock prints? I mean, back in the old days, Yoshitoshi, the, the, what did the, the Hyakurankai, 100 Yoshitoshi prints in the series. They just did this. They just published it. Carvers in a row, carving, printers in a row, printing, publish 100 prints, come back next year, do another 100 prints. So look at John Becker, if you had the resources, this is it, if we could do this. Anyway, I, I can't, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna flip through 154 pages of these. I know, the, our friend Jacques in uh, the, the Netherlands, maybe here today, he, he pops into this stream sometimes, or he'll be seeing it later on. He's really interested in this too, so he and I have been uh, batting these things back and forth. And there's a question of copyright, you know. I mean, there's, there's two things here. One, I cannot simply go ahead and make woodblock prints of these, of course. Okada-san is still alive. We would have to talk to Okada-san for permission to do this. But whether I should scan these and put them up in one corner of the website, can I do that quietly without getting in trouble? I don't know. You know he's alive, and the magazine is still going. And they, of course, have, this is 1970s, so copyright is still active. Actually, this one here, this is, I remember the episode of this. When I saw this published, Okada-san and saiki -san visited my house one day. And we talked about this episode in, in, the, in the video, in, in the movie. When I saw this one, I made some comment to Okada-san about the fact that he enjoys watching Kurosawa movies. You know, he really, he thought that was a good comment. And they are. They're, 
they're cinematic. They're absolutely cinematic. You can see the camera here and then pull focus to see the people in the background. And these just go on page after page after page. And there are 150, 157, 154 episodes of this. I haven't even opened them all. I can't. I don't have time to go through all these and open these all. Astonishing. They're not all great art. I mean, the guy was under the gun. Two every week, he had to do two of these. And these are large scale, they're delicate. She must have sent him the story a couple of weeks in advance. He had to write something, he had to draw something for it. So they're not all drop dead world class great art. But there's such a treasure trove of beautiful, interesting design here. John says, ask the guy for, for permission and do one. I've asked him for permission already. Have you seen the video? I showed you. I showed you the letter that he sent me. This is back in beginnings number one video. I already asked Okada-san. Back when I was still living in Canada, before I ever thought about becoming a pro, I wrote to Okada-san and said, let's work together. And he blew me off at that time. That's fine. I didn't know what I was doing. I met him again when I came here. I met him in 1990. We sat in my kitchen in Hamra, and we talked lightly about the idea that at some point in the future, this was 1990, this was 30 years ago, he and I talked that at some point in the future, let's think about this, okay? And that's where the idea still sits. He's okay for the idea. I'm okay for the idea. The barriers are simply well, the barriers are twofold. The barriers are resources. We are busy. We are busy. But the bigger barrier is what Saiki-san talked to me about later. Saiki-san worked with Okada-san to do four of those. And whatever, what can I say? I'm, I'm, I'm on a public screen here. Okada-san was difficult. Here, the magazine changed format. You're, they're no longer pull out, so you have to do it the other way around. Okada-san was difficult. Saiki-san prepared a set of blocks. They did a test print, took it back. It was magnificent. Okada-san said, no, do this, do this, do this. Uh, okay, yes, sir. They went back, they carved some more blocks, did some more test printing, took it back. It was magnificent. He said, no, let's do this, let's do this. They got into a thing which I have myself. I've had the same experience with uh, printer Gary Lutke years and years ago. Really nice guy, beautiful, interesting designs. There was never any end of it. The publisher did this, he wants more. The publisher did this, wants more. It's a never ending escalation. And the publisher at some point I say, no, I can't spend any more money on this. And the designer says, no, we can't accept that. It's gotta be better, it's gotta be better. Okada-san is extremely demanding. Oh, hello Yamada-san, hello, hello, hello. So the idea that's cooking in the back of my head, I can't do this now for resources and I shouldn't do this now because he is so demanding. I'm 68, he is 85 or something. So what I'm thinking is, I can just sit tight. I can just sit tight. And one day at some point, maybe, we're gonna be writing to his estate and saying, if we pay XXX royalty, can we use some of these? So yeah, somebody's got to sit tight and negotiate with the estate. And whether that's an awful thing to say, I'm sorry, I don't know, but uh, I think that's the only way forward for this. And there's another part to the story. This was a public magazine. There were limits to what he was able to physically show on the page. Some of the pictures are very erotic in mood, but they are not what you would call shunga. They are not, you know, sex pictures, but there's a, the whole, the whole book, the whole thing is steeped in, in this erotic eroticism. And he may have in his folios at home, he may have a bunch of pictures that they could not 
use in the magazine. We've already done our octopus. Maybe, 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 maybe there's something really interesting that could be done here. Oh, look at this. Shiba-san would go nuts for this, a spider woman. Could you imagine the print series from these? Could you imagine this? And not everybody likes these. I get this. There are people who are thinking, Dave, just go on to something else. Enough of this. Some people do not like his way of drawing faces. And in general, actually, Japanese women, to quite a large degree, do not really like the way he draws women's faces. I've heard that feedback from a number of women. They're dramatic. They're scaled. They're just, they're just, oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's not it's there. I mean, you wouldn't want to do. There's 154 episodes here, and each one of them has two pictures. There's like 300 plus of these designs just sitting here waiting to be. They're not even published. There's no book with these inside. They went in a magazine, they were published, thrown in the trash heap, and now somewhere you can find one or two here by digging through. Why do they hate the faces? Hate is the wrong word for it. Uh, my, my previous wife, my kid's mother, she said, oh, no, you don't understand. You're seeing some exoticism that's sort of sexy and whatever. She says, I'm a woman. I don't look like that. I, don't, like, I think her point was that the women look too evil or the women are too, um, what's, what's the word? The women are, are, are calculated and they're not, uh, evil is maybe too much. The women are, are I don't know, what's the word, what's the word, what's the word, you know? And she says, you're just like one of those foreigners who sees Japan, and he just sees exotic, sexy Asian women, you know? We're just women, right? And I'm like, I know, I've been here all these years, now. I know that. But the rest of the world sees Asian women in some sort of a different way than, than, than reality. And she, as an Asian woman, didn't want to be a, a, an object of that, of that of that strange way that the rest of the world sees Asian women. She doesn't want to be part of that. So I get it. I get it. I get it. Someone says, I had a question back in the thread. Can you touch on it? I'm, it's, it's gone to me. I'm sorry. I know. It's gone to me. Speak up again or, or send it to me by email or something. So this one's odd. Eh? So this too. I said, these are not all... This is not all world-class art. This is illustrations done very quickly with a real tight schedule. I know there's no way I would want to sit here making a woodblock print of this one. I personally do not find this attractive. I think it's technically a bit clumsy, uh, whatever. I think what we're supposed to be seeing here, this is supposed to be, I'm sorry, a very young girl. This may be 9, 10, 12 years old girl. The Genji Monogatari, that's sort of a bit of a... Uh, the thing that nobody really talks about with the Genji Monogatari is that story is all about very young girls, very young girls. It's funny, we have this thing happening now, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, where a lot of things where the world thought was normal X years ago are now being looked at as being, oh my God, how did we accept that? And this thing, the Genji Monogatari, which is accepted as one of the world's first novels, Whatever, there's a downs, there's a backside to it, you know. So, just a plain landscape here. Anyway, 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 enough of this. Just so you know, I just really wanted to show you that this thing existed and it's there. I'm not really trying to tease you, but the idea that for future projects, there's just so many things that we could get involved with here. So, so many things. The numbers of projects that, that we could make for woodblock prints are just never, never ending. Never ending. Anyway, okay, okay. Somebody mentioned a question. Oh, has it come back? Okay, has it come back? Making this video and making barons from the I don't know what you've seen. I know. You're going to make your own baron. The thread, the, the, the thing about a baron, uh, what we got, we're at the end of the stream here, but a couple, a couple of things to mention. If you're going to think about making your own baron, 
modern people have used plastic, they've used string, they've used nylon, they've used metal, they've used all kinds of things. That's okay, they sort of work. Bamboo, fine strips of, of bamboo pulled and woven together have a characteristic that all those other things don't seem to have. Bamboo is tough, it's resilient, you print with it, and during the three, four, five, six, seven hours you're doing, it actually starts to lose resiliency and get, get down. And the barren is no longer strong at the end of the day as it was. You put it away, come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's back to normal. It has recovered its strength and resiliency. And you can push this and jam this and push this and jam this for a lifetime. The barren I'm holding here now was probably made before I was born and it's still holding up and still usable. You're mentioning wheat thread, I don't know, but string cord, they die in minutes and they stay dead. So it's not just that bamboo is used because it was a funky, cool thing to do. There really is a deep core meaning to using bamboo skin woven into a fine thread for doing this. So go ahead, experiment with stuff, go ahead. People all over the world, all kinds of people in Japan have done this. There's stuff on the market, as I said, nylon string, cord dipped in glue to give it strength, there's all things. Give it a try, give it a try. People have carved them out of wood. John Amos has got an interesting idea he's doing over there. Give it a try. But, but, show me, show me. And the day you show me something that's gonna top this, whatever, we'll do it, we will use it. But as of yet, we haven't seen anything anywhere even close to a real nice good baron. Lacquered disc which is flexible but strong and that woven coil which has strength and guts which will last a human lifetime and more. Anyway, I've missed lots. I will reread it at lunchtime just so I'm up to date with what's going on here. It's time for me to check out. It's time for me to check out here. Uh, it's Thursday morning. I will be back here Friday, Saturday morning. I guess I will be still working on that little carving for the share certificate, and maybe it'll be finished by then. I'm not sure. And the question is open-ended. What should I be doing next week? I don't know. Who knows? We'll sort out something. Before I go, one more thing. Let me paste again into the stream the link I pasted back at the beginning, a Yahoo auction I won two nights ago. And it's going to be delivered to tomorrow or today or the next day. Take a look at this auction. Those of you who are interested in woodblock prints who think you know something about some of the older prints, 20th century, take a look at that auction and see. Would you have bid for it? How much would you have bid? What is lurking inside the 19 random prints in that auction? Okay, I'm out of here. Thanks very much. See you Saturday morning, Friday night for the rest of the world. Bye-bye for now.